Welcome to the Women in Fishing podcast. I'm Chris Woodward. The Women in Fishing podcast is sponsored by Axon Noble Yacht Coatings, makers of Interlux and All Grip products for boats. For nearly 30 years, Ellen Peel's name has been associated with the pinnacle of billfish conservation as executive director and now president of the Billfish Foundation. TBF launched in 1986 with a mission to promote worldwide management for species including marlin, sailfish, spearfish, and swordfish. Peel and TBF advocate for better scientific data, increased catch tag and release participation, prohibition of commercial billfish sale, gear regulation, and much, much more. Peel is a Mississippi native and a Mississippi and West Coast educated marine resources lawyer. Welcome to the podcast, Ellen. It's great to see you. Thank you, Chris. And all who are listening, it's terrific to be here. I've known Chris, I'd say indirectly through in the fishing world for years. So it's great to finally get together. I know, really. We we kind of, I've always sort of been in the slight offshore, some inshore, you know, that type of thing. And Ellen's world has been blue water. And, um, you know, so we haven't really crossed paths that often, but when we do, it's great. And um, Ellen, you're somebody that I've always uh, appreciated and and respected. Um, And so I wanted to talk to you about some of the the efforts that you've been doing um, over the last 30 plus years. And so I wanted to uh, kind of jump into it and just get a little of your background and say how and when were you first introduced to fishing, whether it's salt or fresh water, and what did you like about it? Well, I was first introduced when I was living in Gulf Breeze, Florida, which is just outside of Pensacola. I was married and my husband and I went with some neighbors out on their boat. They said, we're going to fish a little bit. And I thought, oh, great, poles over the side. What is this all about, you know? And so my eyes clearly were wide open. Uh, You know, it was lovely to be out. Gentle breeze, though I have been in howling hurricanes almost. But the breeze, the fish, the porpoises, it was great. And all of a sudden I hear this. And people start jumping around. And I'm going, I'm amazed. And I watch and I realize, you know, they had a marlin on. And before we knew it, the fish was up alongside the boat and release. Well, needless to say, I was wide awake and the adrenaline was pumping. So that was my first introduction of this is what goes on offshore. Yeah, that real scream is just undeniable. I mean, it's amazing just the first time you ever hear that thing. And especially if there's a big billfish or a wahoo on there and that zip of the line. Oh, my goodness. It's like, you know, it's the opposite of fingernails on a blackboard. It's so thrilling. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and when I first got here, there was one company, and maybe they're still out there, that makes an alarm clock, and that's the alarm. Uh, I thought, oh, my God, that would get you up on your toes and out of bed instantly. I haven't found one yet, but I must admit I haven't been seriously looking because my Doberman gets me up now. Uh, yeah, I have a Labrador retriever who who does the same thing. <laughs> So you mentioned that 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 a marlin was on the line. Were you were were you able to get on the rod for that fish, or when was your first billfish catch? Uh, a little bit later that year. That was 1978, which seems like yesterday. We were out with the same couple, you know, fishing. But I was told I might be able to, and so there were four of us, you know, fishing, and so we had four pin reel fifty internationals. And we were rotating every 20, every 30 minutes, you know. Well, you know, nothing had happened. And so I got into position to be ready. And sure enough, the line went out and there was a marlin on. It was a white marlin. Oh. And, uh, oh, you know, and the last thing you want on your first fish is to lose it. Well, unfortunately, it got off right away. Oh. I, I thought, oh, God, this is not good. But the fish came around clearly because they didn't get all the rods back in and it took the bait again and so you know my adrenaline was pumping you know people are yelling at you trying to help Uh, crank pump crank pump I was not quite sure anyway I was not in sync initially but did get there and after about 15 minutes brought the fish alongside the boat of course I could not breathe because I was so afraid it was going to get off you know, it wasn't long for the crew 
you know, release the fish. And when the fish was released, I realized I was hooked. Mm -hmm. That was it. I thought, my goodness gracious, what an adrenaline trip this is. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it's funny because what that led to then in, in the ensuing years had a lot, I mean, just really turned your entire life around. Yes. Um, so how did you get this sort of billfish management bug and the whole idea to, to be part of the process? We were fishing t- uh, tournaments in the North Gulf Coast out of Pensacola. And at the time, that was in the mid-70s and late 70s, the National Marine Fishery Service, well, it's actually NOAA's lab in Miami and their lab in Panama City, would send a scientist to some of the tournaments. And at the time, Pensacola was the biggest on the Gulf Coast. They had over 100 boats. So the scientist was there, would share some information on the status of billfish, the need for data so they could be better managed, uh, tagging data specifically. So he brought a few tags, showed us how to do it. And then I became very interested. Uh, it was subsequent to that that I went to Ole Miss to get my basic law degree and then on to the West Coast University of Washington in Seattle. And there you had to uh, identify specialty. Mm-hmm. And for a bit, I was thinking big trees, big fish, that adrenaline rush was mighty fine. So I went with big fish and my emphasis area was management of Atlantic billfish. Okay. So, you know, by the time I finished the paper, I actually got a job in Washington, D.C. to represent billfish with a nonprofit, which was cool. I was really psyched. Since I fished, I enjoyed it. You know, I tackled the subject with great vigor. After being in D.C., about a year, the job transferred to St. Petersburg, which was a lovely place. And I worked there again about a year, and I added Fishery Management Council responsibilities in addition to billfish. So I was responsible for other species. But I would keep sending things to TBF. You know, saying, hey, are you guys aware of this? Are you going to do this? What about that? Well, finally, one day, I think it was Dave Lear, I believe, was here then. And he left the job to go back to the Northern Gulf. And so a board member called me and said, would you like to come over here and work for TBF? And I said, well, it's certainly the job I would I believe I would love to have. However, the realities are you guys serious about this? Because I'm really serious. I want to make sure that, you know, some the board is wanting to do something. Right. And so one trustee said, well, you can come over, not considered a job interview. I go, that's fine. I said, how much time do I need to a lot? And he said, probably an hour. I said, all right, that's cool. So I flew over, met with them. Three and a half or four hours later, we were still talking. Wow. So I thanked them and... Uh, went back home or went back to my office with St. Pete. And the next day I got a call saying, look, we really want you in this job. And so I've always had Doberman pincers and I had two then. And I said, well, you know, I have to find a place that would let me have my pups. And Winthrop Rockefeller said, oh, don't worry, Ellen. I have an apartment in Miami. You could stay there for a while. And I said, well, sir, that is very thoughtful and generous of you. But, you know, I wouldn't bring two large dogs into someone else's property. You know, don't worry. It's all marble floors. (laughs) Oh, well, then I thought they could break their legs. Anyway, he had to work with me to find a place elsewhere. And that worked out. Well, great. Wow. And and interestingly, obviously, that was also a period of time when, you know, women being in this, that kind of industry, um, you didn't find a lot of us. I mean, I, I, I'm i the same way. I mean, 30 years ago, I was writing about fishing and, you know, for a newspaper and, and, and there weren't very many women who were doing that. So, I, I, you know, that's that's a great testament to both you and your skills and your knowledge, as well as as their ability to recognize that and, you know, and to invite you aboard. Was that I mean, did you feel like that was everybody was on board with the whole thing uh, when you first started? I think all board members were. They were yeah. very excited. And I didn't put much 
thought into, gee, you're stepping into a male uh, dominated industry. And there might have been, you know, some folks, constituents that were thinking the little lady or the little girl, you know, might be a manby pamby and a little soft. So I don't know if she's really can represent anglers. Well, anybody that knows me right. knows I'm not soft nor a manby pamby. Uh, <laughs> and that whatever I take on, I'm deadly serious about it. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, but also at that time, it was clear right after I got here that after going to a few government meetings, the National Marine Fishery Service had no priority or thought of billfish. You know, I'm like, they're the center of my universe. How could they not be important? So the more I went to meetings, the more I kept raising the issue and, you know, and they finally have gotten on the agendas. The same was true internationally. You know, countries, you know, thought about billfish, but like to say, they're on the agenda, you know, they are not leaving the agenda. And I'm proud to say that TBF established that, you know, credibility with the entities. Yeah. So, I mean, back in, say, 1996, which was your your first year there, uh, what were the greatest challenges? What did you see? Like, and when you spoke to those guys for three or four hours, what were your like, you know, I got to get this done. Can we do this? Well, I think I was so excited and animated that I was just spewing forth all these things that I thought, we need to do, you know, you heard of National Marine Fishery Service, this is how it's done. And so they were very gracious, you know, and it's, it was a diverse board as they all are. And uh, I was thrilled when I got the call the next day, but hesitant because of my pups. And it's all worked out. Good, good. <laughs> well, what was the, was there management at all in 1996 for Bill Fish? What, what existed at that time period? You know, I have to give the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council primary responsibility, they coordinated getting the first billfish management plan passed. There had been an effort, but the commercial industry at the time, I believe, had filed suit. And, you know, when it came to they couldn't land the fish. It then went to all of the councils, the Gulf Atlantic and Caribbean, and they had to work together and reach consensus. I don't know how they did that and how many years it took, but I applaud each of those who participated and supported it. So there was a management plan. So they had heard the word billfish, but no one was doing anything. You know, we they got it on the books that there could be no commercial landings, sale, barter, or trade. But that was it. And that was a great start. But from there, you know, we had to add some teeth to it and get things moving. You know, we initially started doing some socioeconomic studies to try to let governments know, you know, this is an important industry. Some people would say, oh, you're just out having fun. I said, it is pleasurable, but it's an industry and an industry has grown tremendously that jobs depend on it, economies depend on it. So we felt the socioeconomic studies would be good, even though they cannot be the determining factor in any decisions. Right. We also did, you know, started basic research. See this little device? Oh, yeah. This was used to inject tetracycline, oxytetracycline into billfish, and it would stain the ear bones. And the idea was when fish were recaptured, scientists could take out that ear bone and they would be stained like the rings in a tree. Right. And they could count those and determine the age. Unfortunately, those little ear bones are, you know, about the size of my small fingernail and they're very delicate. And so that didn't advance science like everyone had hoped. But TBF gave money for probably 15 years to the International Management Organization to get stock assessments going. Yeah. And those are calculations based on reported landings over years. You're comparing what's landed today compared to 30 years ago or five years ago to establish a trend of are the landings going down because fish are not available. So we got the first stock assessment done and we have continued supporting those. We then hired our own scientist, who is, if not the world's best stock assessment scientist, as one other scientist said, he's in the top three and the other two are dead. 
<laughs> Who's that, Eric? No, well, Eric was the government scientist. Now, okay. this is Dr. Philip Goodyear, who okay. still does some work for us. But okay. we took the lead in working with Eric and NIMPS at, at the lab and uh, ICAT to get, excuse me, stock assessments moving. Um, and I should say that's Dr. Eric Prince. Whether yes. I was mentioning yes. so hard. And uh, Dr. Philip Goodyear. Yes, yes. We also advanced, you know, tagging, basic tagging. You know, they were the tags were available, but do you remember they were the old, I don't think I have one here, but the metal tag heads. Okay. And they were being shed by fish quite easily. So we then advanced redesigning that tag head and we came up with a hydrostatic Scopic nylon substance like they use in surgeries right. uh, for the tag head. Yeah. Over the years, we've modified the tag, you know, lengthening the streamer, shortening the streamer. So we're constantly looking for that. Then, you know, later advanced design and free distribution of non offset circle hooks. Okay. So, and I, I, I will identify or say that I realize some very good anglers can catch a marlin on the straight shaft hook and not gut hook them. Yeah. Most people cannot. And so that's why circle hooks came about and have become relatively popular, I think. Well, back in the in the late 90s, what was the, you know, I mean, I, what what were the anglers like, the billfish anglers? What what kind of mentality did they have? And how how have you been involved in get, having that change? It has been a challenge because from my beginning here, anglers have been enthusiastic to help and are very interested. What is a major challenge is realizing that billfish science is slow, like medical science. You know, initially I had people going, look, we've tagged, I don't know how many fish. And we don't, we haven't stopped all the overfishing and we haven't done this. And I said, but we're making progress on it. And I think to some people that may not be as satisfying. You know, they wanted an answer right then, and I would love to give them one, but it doesn't work like that. Yeah. It's hard to get individuals to understand or get excited about fishing policy. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, it is what determines where they can fish, how they can fish, how many restraints on them. Fishing opportunities just of itself could be lost if we don't get some help from anglers. So I just ask for patience and have always, you know, stay with us. We're making progress. It just doesn't come overnight. Right. Well, I think, I think the ethic has certainly changed too um, among the mass majority of anglers, you know, in the nineties, there wasn't as much thought about conservation and people were just not you know, all together on board. And and over time, it that slowly changed. I mean, in particular, obviously, Florida has been a major catch and release state for, for many years. And they they promoted that and they have, you know, fought, you know, other other anglers who wanted to bring billfish to the docks and hang them up. Uh, like the old pictures that we've all seen, um, you know, but they, so they, Florida has done an awful lot to advance uh, billfish conservation among anglers. Um, and I, it's been harder in other locations and most definitely harder on the Pacific coast because, you know, those are still, there's a still a harvest for Pacific uh, billfish, right? Right. Some nations, yes, not the U.S., but some nations do. And you're absolutely right. When you look at the sport fishing conservation ethic here, it's outstanding. By U.S. and international agreement, U.S. anglers are limited to landing no more than 250 marlin. That's blue and white combined a year. Mm -hmm. And tournaments and anglers are all supporting that. We applaud that. You know, they came and supported uh, TBF's campaign to stop the attempt to list white marlin under the ESA. You know, they support us when we were going for a bluefin tuna quota for the Gulf of Mexico anglers, incidental quota, I must say. So on all the major campaigns, they'll come forward. It's just in between some of the major waves, it gets a little tedious to say, whew, isn't yeah. this exciting? 
<laughs> yeah, I know. It's a day in, day out slog. Do you think that we are where we need to be with um, billfish conservation on the Atlantic coast or would say, does TBF, uh, does, does TBF lobby for release only um, billfish tournaments? No, we do not. And, you know, part of, you know, she's not the soft little lady tree hugger greeny, you know, no, we are a sport fishing conservation organization created by anglers, bar anglers and billfish, you know, So, no, we do not advocate for all release. We want responsible fishing, which is what we see most all the time, you know, uh, but not all release. I think if figures got much worse in terms of stock abundance, I fully believe anglers would support whatever is needed. Our constituents and board represent a good cross-section of users. So we're anglers. Gotcha. Where, what are the stock assessments telling you now based on what you've seen over the last 20 or 30 years? Improvements, thank goodness, not to where we want to be. And it's so strange that the white marlin assessment was done back in June or July and the agency won't say anything about it. Which, really? Yeah, which is, and, and, and of course, you know, with COVID, the scientists couldn't meet. And so that's a, a comfortable precedent that a lot of people rather stay home and, you know, and contribute than to show up. I don't know what the challenges were, but I think it was in part participation, representation, but they've not said squat about the white marlin assessment. Hmm. Uh, so I'm eager to hear, I'm eager to see them do a sailfish assessment and an update on blue marlin. I believe swordfish will be a priority at this year's international negotiations at ICAT in November. So I'm eager to see, I hope that their population abundance is staying up. Now that transitions me into, you know, when you talk about what about the future, you know, we have to, as a large community, kill the uh, extreme vessel speed reduction proposals that are out there. They were only applying to 65 feet and over. And there was some analysis done on compliance. It turned out compliance was overall good, except from the container, the big container ships. Instead of focusing on trying to get compliance on container ships, they've turned now to all the boat owners and anglers of 35 feet and up. And that's not going to make the difference. I just think it's it's a tragedy. The yeah. North Atlantic right whale was listed on the endangered species list in 1970. That's yeah. 50 something years. I say the National Marine Fisheries Service did not do their part to avoid what they have created, a yeah. clash between commerce and conservation. And I believe it rests on them. Yeah. Well, yeah. let me get uh, give a little explainer there. There is there are attempts right now to slow down sport fishing vessels and vessels sim- in, of similar size in regions where right whales are known to uh, calve and to to swim and and to to a, a speed limit of I think what is this ten miles per hour, ten knots, point five miles per hour, and so, somebody won't get up on plane on that. Yeah, if you're trying to go out to the canyons, or if you're going somewhere in the in the South Atlantic, for instance, where I live, um, the Gulf Stream is 80 miles offshore. So I can't imagine, you know, going to a being able to run for a certain amount and then having to go 10 miles per hour for 60 or 70 miles. So that's yeah. you know, it's it, it's something that's been it's being highly contested right now, and obviously it it definitely affects the bill fishing situation. So. What, how, I uh, obviously T- TBF is working to help squash that. And um, so is that sort of your biggest uh, goal for the it's, next few years? It's a major goal, but let me say, uh, Pat Healy, a Viking yacht, has really taken the full charge on that one. And there were 95,000 public comments submitted on this. Now, We don't have the exact breakdown, but we've been told by people who are close to it that there were more in the boating and fishing industry, which is great. 
It's very disappointing that the only response the National Marine Fishery Service has made came out last Friday. <laughs> and it was, we are going to host a one-day workshop in D.C. In, in February and talk about technological, you know, ways to avoid, you know, whales. If they would just go to the U.S. Navy and Woods Hole, they both have marine mammal monitoring programs that you can check in on yourself. So why not draw from that to avoid, to, you know, come up with a, a alert system for, for private boats? Yeah. But for 50 years, they haven't done anything. And now they're just going to say, OK, if you guys just don't use your boat, the whales will be happy. Yeah. Well, how would you invite our listeners to be uh, to participate in TBF's goals and uh, the the conservation of of billfish? Well, let me let me insert one more thing. You know, the second biggest issue right now are the closed zones. You know, they were put in place twenty and twenty one years ago to keep pelagic longlining out of these waters off the east coast and in the Gulf. Well, the National Marine Fishery Service says we need to let the boats back in. And I go, wait a minute, isn't, isn't this like having someone put savings aside each month? And after 20 years, you come back and say, now, go spend all that money because we want to know if this was a good practice. It makes no sense. So what they propose in this 600-page document shrinks it all. It does nothing to add protections for marlin. It's primarily focused on sharks and sea turtles. Now, and the science they're using is questionable. It's based on environmental factors and observer catch data, not on landing data from vessels or landing data, you know, from satellite tagging. So we have huge uh, questions about it. We believe that it needs to go back for a real peer review they published it in a journal, but forgot to mention that one of the authors of the paper is an editor for the journal. They then sent it to an expert panel. But the National Marine Fishery Service actually told those scientists do not look at the methodology. It's the methodology that comes up with the options that the agency is putting in place. So we have found those in HMS cannot explain this. And most people have not read it. We have, we've got extensive comments and we're working different areas to try to get that halted. How how would you invite our listeners to be involved? Many ways, you know, obviously we'd love for you to join, you know, and then you get regular information, but we're not an organization that's just, it's all, it's just membership numbers. No, we're issue oriented. We want to take care of the fish and fishing. You can join, you can start as low as, I think it's $75 now. Uh, you could go on our website. There's a free monthly e-news you can sign up for on the homepage at the very bottom. You can come to our events. We have great parties. It's October 27th this year in conjunction with the Lauderdale Boat Show. Any way, you know, it, that you can associate with us, you can ask questions, you can support. I am more than happy to share what we know and what is the rationale. And hopefully I'm wanting to motivate people to realize policy isn't all boring. It is the way to ensure you can keep fishing. And TBF is your best insurance to keep bill fishing. Yeah. So do do reach out and, you know, work with us. Great. Thank you so much for joining me, Ellen. We really appreciate you um, helping us understand the billfish world and giving us some opportunities to become involved in conservation. Thank so, you. Thank you so very much. I'll be seeing you hopefully on the water. <laughs>